thank you, Almighty God, for your, your word, O oh God, your word that brings life, the word that comes from you, O oh God, the word that you have given to us, O oh God. And Father, I pray that the word would be timely, that the word would be pointing, O oh God, um, and that it would uh, speak to our hearts individually, O oh God, that we might become more like you, that we might be forever changed, O oh God. Pray that you'd hide me behind the cross, that I wouldn't be seen, uh, my words wouldn't be heard, but it would be you, you would be seen, and your words would be heard, O oh God. So have your way today, O oh God, in our midst. Uh, speak as only you can speak, O oh God, we pray. And we thank you and love you, in Jesus' name. We are continuing, um, we're continuing to go through the Gospel of John, um, and we're on chapter 17. And we began um, this chapter, uh, was talked about Jesus praying. Um, this was one of Jesus' last prayers that he prayed, other than when he was in the garden. This was one of the last prayers that we have recorded that he prayed. Um, it was a quite lengthy prayer. But it was a prayer that was specific um, for his people. Uh, a couple weeks ago we talked about Jesus praying for himself. And praying that he would be glorified in his life. This week we're praying about Jesus praying for his disciples. And then next week we'll be talking about Jesus praying for those who will come after he is gone. Um, so we're, today we're talking about Jesus prays for his disciples. Uh, one of the best things that I've found in life is being equipped beforehand to face life on its terms. One of the things I felt when I felt most vulnerable as a child and as an adult is I faced a situation and I didn't, I felt ill-equipped. And when the situation came, I felt unprepared. I felt like I couldn't, didn't have the tools that I needed in order to uh, face that situation and to walk through that situation and get through that situation and to get through those circumstances. And as, a, as an adult, and as I became a Christian, I began to understand that um, as a Christian, um, I'm, a, I'm God's son, of course, but also I began to see and I began to understand that God gave us tools. God has equipped me, God has equipped um, us as individuals uh, with certain uh, equipment to help us face those tools and face those situations, to face those circumstances, to face those difficulties, or face whatever life will happen to bring your way at that time. And to be able to come through successfully, successfully on the other side. And then think about your own life. Think about how maybe as a young person, as an adult, or even now, how you have been in circumstances and situations that have been challenging, that have been difficult, and that you, you, you felt ill-prepared, you felt ill-equipped, you felt like you didn't, weren't ready to handle the situation, you feel like you had what you needed to, to do. Think about that in your own life. And think, and, and, and th and have you ever been there before? And what have you done uh, in the midst of those circumstances and those situations. Well, today we're going to talk about that. How are we going to be equipped to be able to handle life and to handle life on life's terms? And that's what Jesus was talking about with his disciples. Jesus was going to be going, this was, this was after the Last Supper. This was actually, actually during the Last Supper. This was one of, the, one of the things that Jesus had done while he was there. And the disciples were getting ready for Jesus to prepare to go back to the Father. And we learned that that, that was a very difficult time for uh, the disciples because they, Jesus had become very close. He had developed an affinity for the people, uh, uh, for his disciples. And he loved them very, very much. And the disciples loved Jesus. And there was a closeness. And there was a, a close... Um, relationship that was there. And so Jesus is now telling them that I'm going to the Father, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. We talked about that. And he's going to send the Holy Spirit, the, uh, the one that's going to be with you, the, the one that will be in you. 
and, and then also he gives some practical. And he says, I give you the Holy Spirit, but also I'm going to give you some other equipment that you're going to have so that you can be able to uh, face life when I'm not here. And when situations come, you're going to know what to do and how to do it and how to handle it. So let's look at, let's look at this scripture passage. We're going to be looking at passage uh, John chapter 17, verses 6 through 12. And I'll read it. I'll go ahead and read it. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they, and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believe that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but uh, of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And the things, all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I have come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. So looking, at, so looking at this scripture passage, Jesus is talking specifically here to his disciples. And I'm going to look at, um, and I'm going to look at uh, four specific points that I want to point out to that will help um, show us how Jesus uh, taught his disciples to handle life once he was gone, to handle life with practical tools uh, to help them. Uh, first, firstly, Jesus has revealed the Father to those whom were given him. Number, and that talks about a relationship. And number two, his disciples were given the words that Jesus received from the Father. Those are his words. Three, Jesus asked the Father on behalf of those who were given to him. And then, and then it talks about intercession. Um, and then four, Jesus prays for the Father to keep them in his name, in Jesus' name. And that's protection. So let's look at those things. Um, first of all, Jesus revealed the Father to those whom were given to him. That again talks about a relationship. A relationship of God to uh, with his people and his people with God. So what did Jesus do? What was the purpose of Jesus? The purpose of Jesus was to reveal who the Heavenly Father was. What did the disciples have at this point? The disciples had, their, these are all Jewish um, individuals. So all they knew was the God of the Old Testament. All they knew was the God, the Hebrew God. They knew God as Father. They didn't have... They didn't have a fully, a full, complete understanding of uh, Jesus or the Holy Spirit until Jesus actually came. So what Jesus is doing is, is that he's, Jesus was saying that I came from the Father, but I'm revealing the Father to you through me, through my character, through my person, through who, who I am, so that you can know that who God is. So you're going to see God based on your relationship with me. You're going to know who God the Father is based on who your walk with me, your relationship with me, who I am. So you're going to actually know the very God of the universe. In the Old Testament, they couldn't really know. They, the only way that a person could really pray was to have to, like even for example to have their sins forgiven was to tell to a priest and then the priest would go in once a year to um, into the holies of holies in the temple and then he would pray that you would be forgiven but what Jesus was doing here was he revealed the father and says now you can know the father through me and he was showing them who the father was but let's go on here so the, uh, he was saying that, that they were the fathers and he gave them to Jesus. And, uh, and he was telling them, not only did he reveal who the Father was, but they were 
the disciples were very, God's very own possession. In other words, he, they were his children that he purchased, that he desired to have. And now the Father gave them to Jesus, so they were Jesus' possession. So, in other words, the disciples were the very possession of God. They were God's children, and they were Jesus' children. And so, therefore, again, there's like a, a father and a, and, 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 and a child relationship. They're like my sons are my children. They're my possession, not a possession as, a, as something that you, you purchase, but a possession that, is, that has been given to you. Like my boys are given to me as a gift from God. So we were, the disciples, what Jesus was saying was the Father has given them, the disciples, to Jesus as a gift. So they are Jesus' precious possession. The Father's precious possession, but also Jesus' possession. So they're special. So there's a relationship there as a child to a father, a child, uh, so a family relationship. So, and then it also says they have obeyed the Father's word because Jesus has given himself, Jesus has revealed himself, revealed the Father, Jesus has, the Father has given the children to Jesus and the disciples to Jesus, but then he's also given, he's revealed his, they've obeyed the Father's word. In other words, the words of the Old Testament were, this was the Bible, this was scripture, this was the word of God. He gave them, he gave them God's word. So they could see that, you know what, this is the same God that you served in the Old Testament. It's the same God now. But you're just getting a greater understanding because you're understanding who I am. Because I am, I am God as well. And so they're getting a better understanding of that. So he gave them his word. He, um, and they have obeyed the Father's word. They've obeyed what was given to them through Jesus. So, so they took Jesus' word just like they would obey God's word. They didn't look at Jesus as just another prophet. They didn't look at Jesus as just another um, good man or a good person or a good individual. They looked at Jesus as God's very own son, and they were to obey Jesus and carry out Jesus' word. They were to carry out who Jesus, um, they were, who Jesus was and what he said to do, just as if they were serving the Father. So they put Jesus on the same playing field on the same level as the Father. And his word was the same. Because the Jews, for a Jew to serve anyone, they, 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 were, they served a theistic God. In other words, there was only one God. And you couldn't serve anyone else. But Jesus was saying was, I'm on the same playing field, this level playing field here, that I am God as well. And so the disciples believed that. And that's so critical. It's so critical that the disciples believed that. Because if they, had any, if they had any doubt, they wouldn't have obeyed. If they had any doubt who Jesus was and what he came to do, then, or any doubt about his word, they would not have obeyed his word completely, without question. Because it would have been just some other person. But then lastly, at, at this point, it says, they knew, they know everything that was given to Jesus was from the Father. Again, they were convinced in their heart that everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus accomplished was from the Father, and so therefore was equal with what the Father said. And there wasn't any question or any doubt about that. So that's, and that's the, and, that, and, and, and let me emphasize this. Every major cult, every major false religion, every major false teaching in the world believes they, they, they believe that Jesus, they believe that Jesus maybe was a prophet. They believe that Jesus was a good man. They believe that Jesus was someone who was, um, could do uh, maybe a miracle or two, but they didn't believe that he was God come to flesh. They didn't believe that he was God's son. They, therefore, they would not put him on the same level, field, level playing field as God himself or God Almighty. They would not do that. And so therefore, um, they were, um, as Jesus revealed the Father to them, they became convinced 
they became convinced that Jesus was who he said he was, and that he was from God, and that everything he had and everything he did was as if God had said it himself, as the Father said it. And that's so critical because the Christianity is the only religion in the world that puts Jesus on the same level field as God Almighty, as God the Father. Only religion, only religion. Every false religion, every false cult, every false doctrine will deny the very fact, the deity of Christ. They will not serve God. And that will make a big difference in your service to God because if you don't believe that Jesus is God, you're not going to serve him like God. You won't. And that's why Jesus was telling the disciples this. But let's go on here. Um, Let's look at verse. Let's look at verse eight. Here it says, "The disciples were given the words that Jesus received from the Father." Uh, again, it comes back to the disciples received the very words that the Holy Father had given to them. God in heaven had given to Jesus, and Jesus gave them to who? The disciples. He gave them to the disciples from the Father. So to whatever Jesus said wasn't what he made up, but it was the very words that he heard from his Heavenly Father. So therefore, the words that Jesus had could be trusted. Therefore, the words that Jesus had are on the same, again, the same level as what the Heavenly Father said. And they, were, and they were always congruent with what was happening in the Old Testament. Never deviated from the truth of what God taught, because God's scripture always coincides. There's always fresh revelation uh, of Scripture, understanding of Scripture, but it always coincides with what is already written in Scripture. And so Jesus never deviated from that. What he was saying was, again, he spoke the words of God Almighty. He spoke the words of God. He said, this is, thus saith the Lord. And so he gave that to the disciples. And the disciples needed that. Um, it says here that the disciples received them. The disciples received those words. Because they were going to be the words that the disciples were going to use to go and but, preach the gospel to all the world. Had he given them a nice philosophical thesis, had he given them a nice um, uh, words that were sounded nice, the thoughts of people, and they were trying to go out with that into the world, it would have never had any effect. They would have, the words would have come, they would have been there for a little while, the philosophy would have came, and it would have been gone. But the reality was, he was teaching the disciples, the words I'm teaching you are from the Father, and that these are the words you're going to use to go out and tell others about me. Because they're words that came from him, God the Father. And this is so important, um, because when we, uh, when disciples are going to face life, they're going to need to know that they have a relationship with God. When disciples face life, they're going to need to have the Word of God. They were, Jesus knew that they were going to need to have the Word of God because they knew they couldn't face situations without the Word of God. How did Jesus, how did Jesus overcome the temptation while he, while he was in the, in the desert? When, when Satan came and tempted him three times, on three different occasions. He tempted him with his flesh, uh, um, the world, and he, and, and, he, and, 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 he over, and he over, and Jesus overcame the world, the flesh, and the, and, and, and the enemy. And Jesus overcame them with what? Scripture. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Not what man says, because Satan can, Satan quoted scripture to him, but Satan took it out of context. He took it out of context and misquoted it. And Jesus put him back in his place and quoted scripture back to him in the proper context of how God intended it to be taught. And so therefore, when Jesus was giving, him, giving the disciples the word of God, he was equipping them, and equipping them to face life and whatever circumstance, because when you can say the word of God, when you can say the word of God, then you have power, because there's power because it comes from God Almighty Himself. 
Um, as well, it talks about they truly understood that Jesus came from the Father. Not only did they receive his words, but they truly understood that. In other words, they had that deep understanding, deep down, this is it's still in verse 8. They truly understood that Jesus came from the Father. They under, had an understanding. He was from God. He was the legit, he was the real deal, and he was convinced. They truly understood that. Some people, unless you understand that, then you really don't know God. You understand that Jesus, and that's when the light bulb came on for me as a young Christian. I mean, as a young person. I truly understood. Yeah, I, I was always taught, I was raised that, you know, I, taught, I heard about Jesus, I heard about disciples, I heard about, um, you know, the, the great things that they did, but I never truly understood the, the relationship there that Jesus had. And I didn't really understood that, well, God the Father sent Jesus. God the Father sent him, um, and that uh, he came from God, and that Jesus truly represented the Father. Um, um, and they believed that Jesus, the Father sent Jesus. And they had that, and, that, and, I became, and I became convinced in my heart that God really did send Jesus. He sent them. Not because he was a nice thing, not because of the little nice, cute little thing that we celebrated December 25th. Little baby, cute little baby. But that God sent him so that what we celebrate on Easter could purchase us. Which was ugly and cruel. It's not nice like this, but it was ugly and cruel. But so that we could have salvation. But that was what God had done. So that's what God did by sending Jesus. So that um, they and, 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 and truly come to that belief in their hearts. And that's what Jesus said. They truly came to that point where they were convinced that they knew that they knew that they knew that they knew that, they knew that the, what the words that Jesus said, and the words that were given to him by the Father, were from the Father, and that Jesus came from the Father, and that they believed that that was for them. And they believed that truth, and they were convinced of that. And if there was any if there was any doubt in their minds about that, they wouldn't be able to go out and be convinced and go and tell others about who Jesus is. Because there would always be some question, there would always be some doubt, there would always be some wavering going on. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I don't know. But they were convinced in their heart that they knew that they knew that they knew. And I knew that I came to that point in my own walk, in my own heart, that I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus was from God even though I didn't understand it growing up, maybe. But I knew that Jesus was from God. The words that he said were from God. And the things that he did were from God. And I was convinced of that in my heart. And that's what made the difference. That's what made the difference. And that was what was going to make the difference in the lives of the disciples. That they were convinced in their heart. There wasn't any doubt. And that's, going to, that, that's so key. That's so critical. That was so key and so critical. You know that his word, and you know that he came from God. If you're equipped with that, and you're convinced when you face a situation, when you face a circumstance, when those disciples face when people are yelling at them and getting them persecuted, and they say, you deny your faith. Because the disciples had that. Peter was hung upside down. He said, I'm not worthy to be uh, killed in the same way as my Lord. So he was martyred upside down. He was martyred upside down. Because he, he was convinced in his own heart. If you're not convinced of that, you're not really going to go whatever it's going to do in order to follow Christ. It's not going to happen. But the disciples, Jesus said that they knew that in their hearts. And that's why Jesus was confident to send them out and tell others about him. And to face life and to face search circumstances and situations that are going to come along their way, that it's going to happen, that they're going to be ready for because they're convinced of it. I don't, you know, I believe this. And this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm wholeheartedly in. And, and, you know, and the best salesman is someone who believes in their product. The best salesman is someone who believes in their product. And Jesus was saying, disciples believe in their product. And their product was Jesus. So they can be convinced. You're not going to... You're not going to, if you're a car salesperson and, you, and you're trying to sell a car that's cheaply made, and you're not convinced of that, 
you're not going to do a good job of sell, selling the car. But if a car is a well-made car, and it's a decent car, and you, you go out there with full assurance and full confidence that you're going to get that person the best car they, they want, that they're looking for. That's the same way it is with, with the disciples. When they go out, they're going to be able to tell others about Christ with full confidence. Then Jesus asks, uh, and, then, uh, second, and then thirdly, is that Jesus asks on behalf of those who were given to him, verse 9. And that's so critical. Uh, that's intercession. That's intercession. Intercession is praying on behalf of someone else. And so what was he saying, Jesus was saying? Jesus was saying that he was praying on behalf of his disciples. He's going to the Father. He's going to go away to the Father. But that's going to, he's going to intercede. In other words, he's going to pray on behalf of his people. He's going to pray for them. Because he knows he's going to, they're going to need it. He knows that they're going to need it. And they're not going to be able to do anything about it. That's the equipment that God had given his disciples. That reassurance and knowing that when you pray, Jesus is carrying your prayer, carrying your, your voice, carrying your heart, carrying your burden, to the, to the Father. And the Father's hearing. What does the Father hear? Who does the Father listen to? The Father listens to His Son. So when we pray, He's going to, he's, we're taking it to Jesus, and Jesus is taking it before the Father. And the Father's listening, and the Father's hearing. And the Father's going to grant that which is going to happen. So Jesus is asking on behalf of His children. So Jesus was at, telling the disciples, I'm going to go and pray for you. Because I know that what's coming down in life, I know that's coming, what's coming down the road for you as disciples, you're going to face difficulty. The disciples and the apostles faced persecution early in the early church. And there's Christians around the world today that face persecution because of the faith, their faith in God. And the reality is, is that um, they needed to know that someone was praying, that Jesus was praying for them before the Father. To know that and to have that reassurance in your heart that God was praying for you. That God is praying for you. Made the, gave the disciples that extra confidence to know, hey, God's got my back here. God knows what's going on. And then it says, um, and it says in verse 10, it says, they are, um, there is a mutual possession of his people between Jesus and the Father. Um, in other words, again, to know that um, as I talked about in the beginning, they're to know that they are disciples are the fathers and they are Jesus' as well. They're in that possession to know that, you know, uh, I'm praying for you and the Father is going to answer. So, and, and because they're his children and, what, and the Father's going to do, the Father, of course, is going to want to do what? He's going to care for his children. He's going to want to uh, answer them. He's going to want to give them what is good. He's going to want to give them what is right. He's going to want to give them uh, the very best. And to know that, and to have that reassurance in your heart, makes such a huge, huge, huge difference. To know that, yeah, my daddy, my boy's going, that's my daddy. And then his disciples are saying, yeah, God's my daddy. He's my father. I'm his, and he is mine. And Jesus, I'm his. And he is mine. The Holy Spirit, I'm his, and he's mine. So it's a mutual possession. But God, we are his. We are his, we are his, we are his. And nothing can ever change that. Once you come to salvation, once you come to that place of knowing Jesus as your Lord, and as your Savior, nothing can ever change that fact. Just like you can't change the fact that you are... Um, uh, your parents' children, like, I can never change the fact that I'm the son of Fred and Eileen Williams. Can't change that. Can't change it. Can't do it. I mean, by biological parents. Can't change that fact. But the, and it's the same thing, too, is when we come to know Christ, we become born again. Can't change the fact that we are sons of God. Can't change it. You can't lose your salvation. You can't do it. It's not going to happen. You're purchased by the blood of Jesus, and it's never going to happen. 
You may try and walk away from God, but the fact is, the fact remains, that you are God's children, purchased by the blood of Jesus. So, uh, we see that, and that as we are his children, what's going to happen? People are going to see God in us. And Jesus will be glorified. It says in verse 10 that Jesus is glorified in his people. So the disciples wanted them to know that as you follow me, and as you walk with me, people are going to see you, are, are going to see me in you. And then I will be glorified because people will want that. An example would be in, in the book of Acts where uh, Peter and John uh, healed um, this lame beggar. Um, and, 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 and they noticed that, that Peter and John were unlearned men. And it says, but they noticed that Peter and John were men who had been with Jesus. They, in other words, they reflected Jesus in who they were. They reflected Jesus in their character. They had a resemblance of Jesus. Like growing up, because they're on the youngest of ten, um, growing up in school, people knew, knew oh, you're Williams. Because they could tell the resemblance. I guess maybe facial features or hair or whatever. All of us had different color hair, but that's besides the point. That's what happens when you have there's nine, nine, ten, ten kids. But the reality is, is that people could tell us just by looking at us that whose child you were, whose family you came from. So the reality is, is that um, as a Christian, he was, they should be able to, to tell who, Jesus was telling the disciples, they should be able to tell who you are uh, just by how you carry yourself and how you walk and how you function in life and how you handle life. And that's so important. That's so important. That's so important. But that comes as a part of Jesus interceding for us. And because it's a Father, He's going to care for us. And, and then and Jesus will be glorified in that, and they'll see Jesus in us. And they'll see, not John, but they'll see Jesus. And the reality is, I remember, that, I remember uh, some years back, one of my jobs that I was working um, uh, several years back, um, and I remember uh, one of the, my coworkers said to me, he says, what's different about me? Because I had a peace. I didn't yell a lot. I didn't do, a, I didn't fly off the handle a lot. Because the job I was at was a very stressful job. But I did, I took, I, I, I was able to, I guess, navigate that atmosphere, that working atmosphere, with relatively calm, without getting flying off the handle. And, and I was able to say it's because of Christ in my life. So they were, God was glorified in that. Jesus was glorified because they saw how my character was able to handle life and life situations and life's difficulties. Even though I'm not saying the job was as just as it was, but they, they saw Jesus working in me to help me remain calm in the midst of a difficult or stressful situation. So, and Jesus was glorified in that because I was able to testify what? About Jesus. About who? Jesus. And then lastly here it says, Jesus prays to the Father to keep them in his name. So we not only talk about, uh, uh, we talk about uh, a relationship, we talk about giving us his word, um, we talk about intercession, Jesus is praying for us, um, and praying that he would keep us and protect us. But then also, um, it, t it talks about his protection here, and it says um, in verse 11, that Jesus prays to the Father, to keep them in his name. Uh, while he was with them, he kept them in his name, and he guarded them. And not one perish. So, Another piece of equipment that's so necessary is not only having that relationship with God and being assured of that, that relationship with God, not only having His Word and uh, being found on His Word, not only knowing that Jesus is praying for you, but also knowing that he, you have His protection. Knowing that He has sent His guardian angels around you 
care for you, to watch you. I can't tell you how many times where my life could have been snuffed, snuffed out just like that. But because of God's divine intervention and protection, I'm here today to speak about it. And without that, I wouldn't be here. And that's what he was telling the disciples. I'm going to, my protection is right there. I've, as I've been with you, not one of you has been harmed. Not one of you has been harmed except the one doomed to perdition, which was, who was Judas. Because he was never really of God. He never really followed God. The disciples were the ones who were really of God, and they followed God, and they believed God, but Judas didn't. And so therefore, what happened? Judas didn't get the benefit of God's protection, and what ended up happening? He ended up betraying Christ, and he ended up going to destruction. So as believers, we have that benefit of protection of God. You know, when somebody, and the enemy looks at you, he sees, and, and the enemy's coming at you with, 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 with all his fangs and growling at you. And you, know, and you can just point to your point to God right, who's right behind you with a big stick. Big stick. And the enemy has to obey. And the enemy has to bow. Because every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's in Philippians chapter 2. Because the enemy has to obey Jesus. And that's where your protection is. He can try and intimidate you. He can, he, and just, and believe me, the enemy will try and intimidate God's people. And Jesus was trying to tell them that. You're going to face persecution. You're going to face trials. You're going to face difficulties. And your hair is going to be raised up on your back sometimes because it gets so scared. It gets so hairy. It gets so difficult. It gets so intense. But I'm, I've protected you here. And when I'm gone, I'll continue to protect you. You're not going to perish. You may go through, it may be difficult, but I'm going to protect you. I'm going to care for you. You're not going to, nothing's going to happen to you that I won't protect you through. Not that you're going to be immune from difficulties. I'm not saying that. He wasn't saying that. But he said that I'll protect you and I'll care for you in the midst of whatever comes that way. He will. So, as we look at this, it's so, it's so important to know that um, Jesus never minced his words, nor did he ever leave his people without hope. He wanted his people to be equipped. Just like he wanted to equip his disciples, he wanted to have to make sure his disciples were equipped, because he knew that, um, as we're, and we're going to find this out next week, that those who are going to come, that means us, those who are going to come after the disciples are going to be the ones that are going to carry on the message as well. Because disciples will die, and then the message, and then someone else will have to carry on. So this message is for us as well, and for those who will come after us as well. And so the reality is we need to know, number one, that who Jesus is, that you know he came from the Father. That we are his children, bought by his blood. And we're convinced of that. Convinced in your heart, and you know that you know that you know that you know that that who Jesus is. And so when life's circumstances come, when difficulties come, you're convinced of that. And when somebody tries to challenge your faith and say, no, Jesus isn't God. No, Jesus isn't the right way to go. No, Jesus isn't the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. And then you're convinced and say, yes, it, yes, he is. And you're able to stand firm and strong, even though maybe, and your knees may be shaking, and you may be buckling, but you know that you know that you know, and you're convinced that. That's key, because you have a relationship with him. Number two is, you have his word. When you have your word, when difficulties come and trials come, you can, and, you, and, you, and you've been in God's word, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though even I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. your rod and your staff. They comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the Word of God, Psalm 23. So when you have the Word of God, you can stand in life's storm, and when difficulties come, and when trials come, and when people come at you, you can say, yes, God is my shepherd. And then, you know what? He's got a big staff. And when that wolf tries to come, he's got to knock that wolf out. But you can stand in God's Word because you know His promises. The Word says, the Scripture says, His promises are yea and amen. The word yes and amen. You're never going to fail. God's word never fails. So he gave that to him, knowing that it's never going to fail. Interceding. Knowing when your heart's overwhelmed. Knowing when your heart's overburdened. When your heart's, you can't take it anymore. And it's difficult. Jesus knew that they needed to know deep down inside their heart. Yeah, I got it. Give it to me. Give it to me. Philippians 4, 5, and 6. And then the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Knowing that you give it to Jesus, His peace is going to come. Even though it may seem overwhelming. Even though it may seem difficult. Even though it may seem like I can't do it anymore. Knowing, just knowing that someone else is praying for you. Especially knowing that Jesus is praying for you. And He's got your back. And the Father hears you. And to know and to have the reassurance in your heart can make all the difference in the world because if you don't know that someone else is praying for you, you could go into hopeless despair. Been there. But being reassured in my own heart, knowing that God heard me because he's interceding, Jesus interceding, and I had renewed hope. Because of the intercession of Jesus. And then, knowing that he protects Knowing to have that gives me, you know, that gives us that confidence that if God asks me to do something or I face something that's really difficult that I know can be pretty precarious, pretty dangerous, that I know that God can protect me and care for me and help me in that situation and circumstance, and knowing that He's going to give me everything I need and He's going to protect me, He's got me. The Son, I got you. Daughter, I have you. You know, just as I was with, you know, like this, you know, I've, I've always been with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I knew you in Psalm 139, 13 and 14. Uh, I knew you while I was yet in your mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I knew you. I had you, John. I had you when you were little, John. When you were little, you were your only one. When your parents lost everything. I had you. I protected you. I cared for you. I was right there. When you were almost swept out into the ocean and drowned, and your sister grabbed your hand, I was there. When you're driving the little go-kart, and the car came right up there, and you stopped the car, I was there. The protection, I was there. I'm going to still be there. And that's what he wants us to know and be reassured of in our hearts. You know? He's not going anywhere. That's a great piece of equipment to have. That assurance of your heart. He's your father. Jesus is your Jesus is your father. The Father is your Father. The Holy Spirit. Right there for us, though. God before us, who can be against us? Amen? You know, and I think that that's the key thing. But it, it, again, it's based on that relationship. Make sure that you know Jesus. Make sure that you truly know him in your heart. You've invited him to come into your heart. And you invited him to be the Lord and the Master and the Savior of your life. Because all this equipment is ours as a part of knowing Jesus. And it's not ours, just like Judas, who really don't know God. They know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, he's giving you his definition of what eternal life is. 
Now, the idea to know is not an intellectual knowledge. It's like, I know, I know President Obama because of what I've read about him, what I've heard him say, what I've heard him speak, what I've heard other people say about him. I have an intellectual knowledge. But what he's saying here in this, he's talking about a relational knowledge. I have a relationship with my wife. I mean, I know my wife because I have a relationship with her. Do you think that you can know about someone? Or you can know someone based on a relationship. And this is what you